not working. <laughs> okay. There will now be a moment for silent prayer or meditation. Thank you. May I also ask you to remain standing for a moment of silent prayer for those who have departed within the whole of South Africa since COVID-19. Thank you. Please take your seats. Honorable members, the president has called for this joint sitting of the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces in terms of Section 84.2D of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa read with Joint Rule 71B in order to outline South Africa's economic reconstruction and recovery plan. I now wish to call the President to the podium. Mr. President. of the National Assembly, Mr. Nimudise, the Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Mr. Amos Masondo, the Deputy President, David Dabede Mabuza, Ministers, the Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members of the National Assembly, and the NCOP members who are here in the house and those who are participating online. And fellow South Africans, I've requested this sitting of the Joint Houses of Parliament to present the plan for the reconstruction and recovery 
of our economy and our country. In contrast to the State of the Nation address, where we usually address the broad program of government for the year, today I want to focus on the extraordinary measures that we must take to restore our economy to inclusive growth following the devastation caused by COVID-19 to our people's lives and to our country's economy. This is a plan through which all of us as South Africans should work together to build the economy of our country into an inclusive economy and also in a new economy. The objectives of the plan are clear. Firstly, it is to create jobs primarily through aggressive infrastructure investment and mass employment programs. Secondly, to reindustrialize our economy, focusing on small businesses, growing them, and strengthening medium and large businesses. Thirdly, it is to accelerate economic reforms. Thank you, Helga. So, but the woman to move. Okay, so it's a signal. Fourthly, to fight crime and corruption. And fifthly, to improve the capability of the state. All these objectives are linked to the vision of our country set out in the National Development Plan. Madam Speaker, Chairperson of the NCOP, on this day, seven months ago, we declared a national state of disaster to confront the greatest health emergency that the world has known in more than a century. Since then, the coronavirus has infected more than 38 million people across the world and has been responsible for the deaths of more than a million people. The reality that we must confront is that the pandemic will not be over soon. Globally, the number of COVID cases per day is currently at its highest level since the start of the pandemic. This has far-reaching implications in every area of human development, from education, health, from food security, poverty alleviation, from the empowerment of women to social stability. The pandemic continues to cause severe damage to the global economy affecting trade, investment, production, international travel, and global supply and demand. No country, not even ours, has been spared. No economy has been left unaffected. This is also the cause of our own, the case on our own continent, rather. In South Africa, the pandemic has caused great hardship and suffering. In the 220 days since our first recorded case, more than 18,000 people have been confirmed to have died from COVID-19. The loss of these lives is not only devastating to the families who have lost their loved ones, but also to our nation. South Africa has over 700,000 confirmed cases. At present, 90% of those infected have recovered. As a result of the measures that we took to delay the transmission and to prepare our health facilities, we were able to withstand the massive surge of infections in the middle of July. At that time, new cases were being detected at an average of 500 an hour. 
that was particularly a dark time in the life of our country. While the national lockdown in April had a significant impact on economic activity, the economic consequences of an uncontrolled surge would have been far worse. Due to the dedication and sacrifices of millions of South Africans, we were able in many ways to limit the impact of the pandemic on the lives and the livelihoods of our people. For the last month and a half, even as we have significantly eased the restrictions that were imposed on movement and social and economic activity, the average number of daily cases has remained relatively stable at less than 2,000 cases. But it is far too soon to declare a victory over this virus. The World Health Organization warns that many countries have had a significant resurgence of infections following four to eight weeks of low transmission. The World Health Organization has also advised South Africa that now <clears throat> we're entering a phase that requires high vigilance and heightened readiness to respond. Rather than easing our prevention efforts, including social distancing and observing health protocols, we must intensify all these measures further to reduce new cases to less than 1,000 a day. This virus, coronavirus, will remain part of our lives for some time to come. And therefore, we need to adjust to this new reality and also to this new normal in all areas of our lives. Our health system must remain adequately staffed, equipped, and financed to ensure that we continue to save lives. We must rebuild, we must repair, and restore our country, not after COVID, but right now, in the midst of COVID. Our country had immense challenges for a number of years before the coronavirus hit us. The pandemic has worsened the many challenges that we were facing as a nation and as a people. Poverty and inequality have continued to deepen, threatening many South Africans with hunger and a sudden loss of income. Our economy, like other economies, has contracted sharply. Many businesses have closed and many jobs have been lost. Notwithstanding these challenges, we were duty-bound to respond as a government and as a nation to this pandemic in a way that demonstrated our care for the lives and livelihoods of South Africans. Our response to the pandemic was therefore swift and has, in a number of ways, been three-pronged. Firstly, a robust health response. Secondly, a social and economic relief. And now, an economic recovery. As we anticipated, the impact of the pandemic on the livelihoods of our people, we responded by implementing a massive social and economic relief package to support companies, to support workers, households, and individuals in stress. We announced a relief package which, with a total value of 500 billion rand, or around 10% of our gross domestic product, is the biggest on the African continent and compares favorably with other countries in, say, the G20. Relative to the size of our economy, our social and economic relief response to COVID-19 
is roughly on par with countries like Canada, Spain, the United States, as well as Australia. Through the special COVID-19 grants and the top-up of existing grants, which are close to 40 billion in additional support, this has been provided directly to more than 17 million South Africans from poor households. Studies have shown that these grants were vital in reducing the impact of the pandemic on levels of poverty and hunger. The evidence that has come to light suggests that the expansion of social protection has kept more than 5 million people above the food poverty line during the past six months. The special COVID-19 grant in particular represents a significant achievement reaching more than 6 million unemployed people in a short space of time. More than 960,000 companies have benefited through the UIF wage support scheme and through the grants and loans provided by various government departments and public entities. More than 4 million workers have received 49 billion rand in wage support, helping to protect these jobs even while companies were not able to operate. In addition to those businesses that have received direct support, many more companies have benefited from tax relief measures worth in the region of about 40 billion. The South African Reserve Bank acted swiftly to support the economy and to protect our country's financial system by reducing interest rates to their lowest level in more than 50 years. With a view to protecting jobs and saving companies that employ our people from bankruptcy, we introduced another important intervention in the form of the 200 billion loan guarantee scheme. This scheme has thus far provided 16 billion rand in low interest rates loan to almost 12,000 businesses. Banks have together provided an additional 34 billion in debt relief to individuals as well as businesses. Nonetheless, as far as I'm concerned, this is far short of what is needed and what is possible and what should be done. We are therefore working with the banks to ensure that more companies are able to access this assistance as they resume their operations and that the full potential of this scheme can be realized. I had a conversation with the leaders of the various banks in our country, and I express this view very strongly to them that we do need to review how this scheme is being taken up by various companies. And I express to them that they should not be setting up barriers for companies not to be able to get the scheme. We must make the scheme simple. Yes, there should be all the due diligences that are observed, but it is these companies that employ our people and we would like them to continue funding them so that they can continue employing people and even more people. I am certain that the banks will come back with a refined scheme <coughs> working together with Treasury. The combined effort of the measures taken by government and its social partners has been to preserve our country's economic capacity and lay the foundation for a more rapid recovery. Now, despite these vital interventions, however, the damage caused by the pandemic to an already weak economy, to employment, to livelihoods, to public finances, 
and to state-owned enterprises has been colossal. More than two million people lost their jobs in the second quarter of this year. Our economy contracted by 16.4% when compared to the previous quarter. National Treasury expects a significant shortfall in revenue collection. This economic shock is unprecedented in our country and it will take an extraordinary effort to recover from it. As even the darkest of clouds has a silver lining, we need to see this moment as a rupture with the past and also an opportunity to drive fundamental and lasting change. It is an opportunity not only to recover the ground that we have lost over the course of the pandemic, but to place the economy on a path of growth. We are therefore presenting before this joint sitting of parliament and the country a reconstruction and recovery plan to drive growth that is inclusive, but growth that is also transformative. The South African Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan builds on the common ground established by the social partners, being government, labor, business, and community organizations. And this has been done through intensive and detailed consultations over the last few months. It is informed by the work of Cabinet's economic cluster, working with government departments and Cabinet itself, and draws on the contributions of the leading economists who make up the Presidential Economic Advisory Group. From government side, leading the economic cluster, I'd like to thank Minister Kensani Kubai Ngubani and Minister Gwede Mantashe who have steered our work uh, in reaching to this point. I do wish to applaud the remarkable efforts, particularly from our social partners in NEDLEC, in reaching consensus on the actions that are required to rebuild our economy and the firm actions that all social partners have committed to contribute to the country's recovery. We know from the examples of several other countries that social compacts are, the essential, are essential to effective and sustainable growth and development. As we implement this plan, government remains committed to the agreements that were reached through the NEDLEC process. Honorable members, the work that we have embarked upon to rebuild our economy after the devastation of coronavirus is in the end guided by the vision 2030 of the National Development Plan and the program that was outlined at the beginning of the sixth administ democratic administration where we set out key priorities to drive change and transformation in our country. The depth of the crisis caused by the pandemic has indeed sharpened our focus and our determination to address the challenges that face us. The creation of jobs is at the center of the reconstruction and recovery plan. We must get our people back to work, back into their jobs, the jobs that were lost during the pandemic. We are determined to create more employment opportunities for those who were unemployed before the pandemic or who had given up looking for work. This means unleashing the potential of our economy by, amongst others, implementing necessary reforms, removing regulatory barriers that increase costs and create inefficiencies in the economy, 
securing our energy supply, and freeing up digital infrastructure. This plan directly responds to the immediate economic impact of COVID-19 by driving job creation and expanding support for vulnerable households. We aim to do this primarily through a major infrastructure program and a large-scale employment stimulus, coupled with an intensive localization drive and industrial expansion. The interventions outlined in this plan will, one, achieve efficient, secure, and reliable energy supply within two years. They will also create and support over 800,000 work opportunities in the immediate term to respond to job losses. They will also unlock more than one trillion rand in infrastructure investment over the next four years. They will also reduce data costs for every South African and expand broadband access to low-income households. But they will also reverse the decline of local manufacturing sector and promote reindustrialization through deeper levels of localization and exports. But they will also resuscitate vulnerable sectors, such as tourism, which have been hard hit by the pandemic. Now, according to the modeling done by the National Treasury, the implementation of this plan will contribute an additional 1.7% to the baseline of 1.3% economic growth, bringing average growth over the next 10 years to about 3% per annum. Our recovery will be propelled by swift reforms to unleash the potential of the economy and supported by an efficient state that is committed to clean governance. This will be transformative, this will be inclusive, it will be digital, green, sustainable, and it will invest our human capital to lay the foundation for the future. The economic reconstruction and recovery recognizes that to support a rapid economic rebound, South Africa needs to focus on a few high impact interventions to ensure that they are executed swiftly and effectively. When we looked very closely at what needed to be done, we realized that we could have had up to 54 areas of interventions, but we decided that we needed a few where there would be swift implementation, where we would be able to see sustained progress, and that is the route that we have chosen. The reconstruction plan has four priority interventions. Firstly, we are embarking on a massive rollout of infrastructure throughout the country. Infrastructure has immense potential to stimulate investment and growth, to develop other economic sectors, and to create sustained employment, both directly and indirectly. We have developed a robust pipeline of projects that will completely transform the landscape of our cities, of our towns, and indeed of our rural areas. By the end of June 2020, we had 276 catalytic projects with an investment value of 2.3 trillion rand. Moreover, a list of 50 strategic integrated projects and 12 special projects was gazetted in July 2020. These catalytic projects have been prioritized for immediate implementation with all regulatory processes fast-tracked 
enabling over 340 billion rand to, in investment. These projects are at various stages of the project life cycle. Those that are already in construction will see the future phases brought earlier for implementation, including some human settlements projects which have already received bulk financing to unlock them. We are exploring the use of credit enhancing instruments to unlock bulk water infrastructure and national roads improvement projects. Our infrastructure build program will focus on social infrastructure such as schools, water, sanitation and housing for the benefit of our people. We will focus on critical network infrastructure such as our ports, our roads and rail that are key to our economy's competitiveness. We have taken steps to remove the constraints that have over time hampered infrastructure delivery over a number of years. To ensure that there is active implementation of our infrastructure build program, we have established what we call Infrastructure South Africa and the Infrastructure Fund with the capacity to prepare and package programs. And this is precisely what they are already doing. This approach is already encouraging the private sector investors to help us build capability for infrastructure delivery within the state and to develop blended financing models. The infrastructure fund will provide 100 billion rand in catalytic finance over the next decade, leveraging as much as 1 trillion rand in new investment for strategic infrastructure projects. Several projects are already, have already started and they are already in construction. These include human settlements projects such as Matlosana N2 in Northwest, Lufureng in Gauteng, Greater Konobia in KZN, and Vista Park in the Free State. Together, these represent an investment value of 44.5 billion rand. In total, we have gazetted 18 housing projects to the value of 130 billion, which together will produce more than 190,000 housing units. Transport projects currently under construction include the N1 Polukwane and the N1 Musina with a total value of 1.3 billion. Within the next six months, we will embark on the modernization and refurbishment of the commuter rail network, include the Mabupane line in Swane and the central line in Cape Town will expand the national rural and municipal road rehabilitation and maintenance program using local labor intensive methods. We will also fast track the implementation of gazetted strategic infrastructure projects through the approval of credit enhancing instruments, the provision of bulk infrastructure and the speedy processing of water use licenses, environmental impact assessments, and township establishments. And we will also adapt the infrastructure procurement framework to enable public-private partnerships and unlock new funding. Our second priority intervention is to rapidly expand energy generation capacity. We are accelerating the implementation of the integrated resource plan to provide a substantial increase in the contribution of renewable energy sources, battery storage, and gas technology. This should bring around 11,800 megawatts of new generation capacity into the system by 2022. 
more than half of this energy will be generated from renewable sources. In the immediate term, agreements will be finalized with independent power producers to connect over 2,000 megawatts of additional capacity from existing projects by June 2021. The risk mitigation power procurement program will unlock a further 2,000 megawatts of emergency supply within 12 months. The process to implement bid window five of the renewable energy program has already begun. We are taking further steps to enable power generation for, en for own use. The current regulatory framework will be adopted to facilitate new generation projects while protecting the integrity of the national grid. Application for own use generation projects are being urgently fast-tracked. The work of restructuring ESCOM into the three separate entities for generation, transmission, and distribution is continuing, and this will enhance competition and ensure the sustainability of independent power producers going forward. To achieve this, a long-term solution to ESCOM's debt burden will be finalized building on the social compact on energy security recently agreed to by social partners. Through these measures, we aim to achieve sufficient, secure and reliable energy supply within two years. Our third key intervention is an employment stimulus to create jobs and to support the livelihoods of our people. Large-scale job interventions driven by the state and social partners have proven effective in many countries that have faced devastation from wars and other crises. We have committed 100 billion rand over the next three years to create jobs through public and social employment as the labor market recovers. This starts now with over 800,000 employment opportunities created in the months ahead. The employment stimulus is focused on th those interventions that can be rolled out most quickly and have the greatest impact on economic recovery. At the heart of the employment stimulus, is a new innovative approach to public employment which harnesses the energies as well as the capabilities of the wider society. It uses the considerable creativity as well as the initiative and institutional resources that exist in our society to respond to local community priorities. These activities will be locally driven allowing participants to earn an income while contributing to the prospects of their community. Traditional forms of public employment are being scaled up and new forms of public employment created to meet the immediate need right now. We are going to expand our natural resource management programs such as working on fire and working for water. We are going to create 300,000 opportunities for young people to be engaged as education and school assistants at schools throughout the country to help teachers with basic routine work so that more time is spent on teaching and enabling learners to catch up from the time lost because of COVID. This is a great opportunity for young people. And having met a number of young people, this is something that we are looking forward to. More than 60,000 jobs 
will be created for labor intensive maintenance and construction of municipal infrastructure as well as rural roads to support our health care system and an additional 6,000 community health workers and nursing assistants will be deployed as we proceed with the implementation of the national health insurance. Public employment will be expanded at the provincial and city level, contributing to cleaner, greener, and safer public spaces and improved maintenance of our country's facilities. In all of these programs, we will ensure that recruitment is fair, recruitment is open and transparent, and that opportunities are advertised widely. To assist young people who are unemployed to access these and other opportunities, we will launch the National Pathway Management Network as a platform for recruitment and other forms of support. Finally, the employment stimulus includes direct support for livelihoods and the protection of jobs in vulnerable sectors. Support is being provided to more than 100,000 early childhood development practitioners and to 75,000 small-scale farmers whose production was disrupted by the pandemic. Grant-making programs are being expanded in the creative, cultural, and sports sector, and funding has been allocated to protect jobs in cultural institutions such as museums and theaters. More than 40,000 vulnerable teaching posts are being secured in schools which have lost income from fees. The implementation of the employment stimulus has already commenced. Each of these work opportunities is fully funded and ready for implementation. The speed and urgency with which we are expanding employment programs demonstrates our commitment to support those who are without work at this point in time. As these and other recovery measures are being rolled out, we need to do everything in our means to provide support to those in society who continue to face hunger and also continue to face great distress. We will therefore be extending the special COVID-19 grant by a further three months so that we assist our people who are in distress. We had announced that this special COVID grant will come to an end after six months, but having received a lot of representation from the organizations that represent our people across the board. And also having realized that pending the full implementation of these measures that we are announcing, there will be a gap of some three months where we need to give support to our people to continue the support that was given six months ago to make it nine months. The stretched nature of our financial resources does make it difficult and impossible to extend it beyond the further three months. The challenges that are being faced by our country from a fiscal point of view dictate that we should only be able to do it for the next three months. We know that there are discussions that are going on in our country about the basic income grant, and we say those discussions should continue, but we do need to rebuild our economy. We do need to reposition our economy so that it can be stronger and 
in the near future we should be able to engage in discussions about measures such as basic income grant. What we are doing now will maintain a temporary expansion of social protection and allow the labor market sufficient time to recover. Our fourth key intervention is a drive for industrial growth. This is the context of a steady decline of a manufacturing base over many years. To place our economy on a new trajectory, we are going to support a massive growth in local production and make South African exports much more competitive. We will build on the work that is, was being done in several areas before the pandemic struck. Through the first two South African investment conferences, we managed to secure pledges of around 664 billion rand in new investment. To date, just over 170 billion rand of capital expenditure committed during those investment conferences has been invested in projects for construction and buying equipment is essential to mining, that is essential to mining, manufacturing, telecommunications, and agriculture. Last year, South Africa recorded its first trade surplus with the European Union, driven by record exports of manufactured goods. Our country produced and exported more motor vehicles last year than in any previous year. And that records great progress about the capability of our manufacturing base. Our agricultural sector has continued to grow with a bumper maize harvest and the expansion of many high-valued crops. We have positioned South Africa as one of the most attractive destinations in, world, in the world rather, for global business services. Despite the weaknesses in our economy, despite the devastation that has been caused by the coronavirus, these are some of the strengths on which we can build and strengthen the economy of our country. There are huge opportunities that we can seize through effective partnerships, targeted deployment of resources, and the right policies and active implementation of our plans. South Africa currently imports around 1.1 trillion rand of goods excluding oil every year. If we were to manufacture just 10% of those goods locally, it is estimated that we can add 2% points, 2 percentage points to our annual GDP. The rest of Africa currently imports 2.9 trillion rand worth of manufactured goods from outside the continent every year. If South Africa were to supply just 2% of those goods that the rest of the continent imports, it could add 1.2 percentage points to our annual GDP. So these are the opportunities that lie out there for us to grab. And if we succeed in reaching our target of 1.2 trillion rand in new investment by 2023, it could add around 2.5% to our annual GDP. It is to realize this huge potential that the social partners have agreed to prioritize a range of consumer and industrial products for local procurement. During the course of our deliberations and discussions, all the four components of our social partners realize that herein lies a great opportunity for our economy. Together with business and labor, we will soon be publishing localization targets for goods in areas such as agro-processing, healthcare, basic consumer goods, 
industrial equipment, construction materials, and transport rolling stock. We will enhance, enforce rather government policies to ensure that all public infrastructure projects use locally made materials, including steel products, cement, bricks, and other components. We will support the efforts by organized business. We are planning to establish supplier development programs for large companies and in key sectors. And we welcome the commitment of our unions to ensure their investment companies increasingly invest in companies that buy from local manufacturers. The NEDLEC agreement commits all companies and government entities to publicly disclose in their annual reports the value of procurement from local producers and on the steps taken to improve localization. Now, the, the social partners at NEDLEC have also agreed to support a massive buy local campaign for this festive season with a particular call to support women-owned enterprises, small businesses, and township enterprises as well. And we call on every South African to contribute to our recovery effort by choosing to buy locally made goods and to support local businesses. Yes, government will definitely do the same. This is one way that each and every one of us can contribute to building, to restructuring our economy, to restoring it, to rebuilding it, but also to get us to get into the mode of a new economy. Many countries that have seen exponential growth have relied on locally made goods because locally made goods is not only lacquer, it is also about creating jobs in our own countries. A vital part of growing our industrialization efforts are the sectoral master plans, which bring all partners together to agree on specific measures to improve productivity, investment, and competitiveness. There are currently a number of master plans that are in place in the automotive sector, in the clothing and textile sector, in poultry and sugar. We are now working to finalize master plans in the digital economy, in forestry, in agriculture, agro-processing, the creative industries, in aerospace and defense, in renewable energy, steel and metal fabrication, as well as in furniture. We did say that one of the ways that we want to one, restructure our economy and to grow our economy is to focus on the various sectors of our economy so that we no longer just talk about the economy in generalities. We must be focused and we must be able to ensure that all the key players in every sector of the economy are able to sit and collaborate over the growth plans of those sectors. And we've already seen good results with various sectors like the automotive sector, the textile and clothing sector, poultry, and sugar as well. A central pillar of this work is the transformation of our economy, creating space for new black and women entrants and take deliberate steps to change ownership and productive patterns. In promoting localization and industrialization, we will be focusing in particular on the development of small, medium, and micro enterprises, including cooperatives. This will take place alongside the development of rural and township economies. There are between 2.4 million and 3.5 million SMMEs in our country, with the largest number in the informal and micro sectors. 
They offer the greatest untapped potential for growth, employment, and fundamental economic transformation. Through a focused support program, we will support small businesses participation in, in the manufacturing value chain. This will include the targeting specific, this will include targeting specific products for manufacture by SMMEs for both and domestic market and for exports. It will also include the provision of business infrastructure support, financial assistance through loans and blended funding, facilitating routes to market and assistance with technical skills, product certification, testing and quality assurance. Economic growth cannot be realized without the inclusion and the active participation of women. Among the other measures we have outlined, we will be working with women empowered companies to progressively reach our target of directing at least 40% procurement spend on such enterprises. This is a great opportunity that we are opening for women-led and owned businesses. This is also a vital part of our program to end gender-based violence and femicide, which is fueled by gender inequality particularly economic disparities between men and women and gender non-conforming persons. In addition to these priority interventions, we will create enabling conditions for a competitive, inclusive, and fast-growing economy. We are fast-tracking reforms to reduce the cost of doing business and lower barriers to entry. The current timeframes for mining, prospecting water and environmental licenses must and will be reduced by at least 50% to facilitate new investment. The Petroleum Resources Development Bill will be finalized to unlock our country's enormous untapped potential in upstream oil and gas reserves. Although international tourist travel is likely only to recover in the medium term, our efforts are now focused on implementing an efficient e-visa system and extending visa waivers to new tourism markets. To support tourism over this peak season that is coming, we will shortly be publishing an expanded list of countries from where resumption of international travel will be permitted, which will be supported by targeted marketing in, in partnership with the private sector. Now, we urge all South Africans to continue to explore their own country in support of the tourism recovery process as one of the hard-hit sectors by COVID-19. We will shortly publish the revised list of critical skills and occupations in high demand and priority occupations to enable highly skilled individuals to be speedily recruited and expedite the issuing of special skills visas to support local firms. We are promoting greater private sector participation in rail, including through granting third-party access to the core rail network and the revitalization of branch lines. We will establish a single economic regulator in transport as a matter of agency to promote competition as well as efficiency. Work is now underway to improve the efficiency and capacity of our ports in Durban, in East London, in Moha, as well as in Cape Town. The release of high frequency spectrum by March 2021 and the completion of digital migration will in the end reduce data costs for firms as well as for households and individuals. 
This process is being managed, as we know, by ICASA and will promote transformation. It will also reduce costs and increase access. We are developing innovative way, new ways to provide low-income households with access to affordable high-speed internet through connection subsidies for broadband and support for public Wi-Fi hotspots. Decisive action against crime and corruption is essential for inclusive growth. Criminal elements in our country have taken to the illegal occupation of construction sites and soliciting protection money from businesses. Now, this will come to an end. Of course, it is impeding economic growth. Now, to combat these practices, a joint rapid response team at a national and provincial level will respond to the problem of violent disruptions and construction sites and other business activities. A well-functioning revenue service is central to our economic recovery program. Yeah. The turnaround at, at SARS has begun in earnest, and the significant areas of tax evasion and tax fraud have already been identified. SARS is rebuilding its capacity to reverse the decline, to improve compliance, and to recover lost tax revenue. We are working to clamp down on the illegal economy and the illicit financial flows, including transfer pricing abuse, profit shifting, VAT and customs duty fraud, under invoicing of manufactured imports, corruption, and other illegal schemes. The decisive action we have taken to prevent, to detect, and act against COVID-related corruption will strengthen the broader fight against crime. The Special Investigation Unit has made significant progress in probing allegations of criminal conduct in all public entities during the national state of disaster. The work of the SIU continues, and it will also continue here if you wish in Parliament, and the outcomes of the investigations will be made public once all the due processes have been completed. Law enforcement agencies are being strengthened and they are also being provided with adequate resources to enable the identification and swift prosecution of corruption and fraud. We wish to assure all South Africans, I would like to assure all South Africans, if there ever was doubt, that there will be no political interference. Repeat. There will be no political interference with the work of our law enforcement agencies. I will make sure that there is none. Because it is only when there is no political interference that we are able to observe the rule of law and strengthen all our agencies in the criminal justice system. We will continue to strengthen the framework to ensure that political office bearers at all spheres of government do not do business with the state, and we welcome the agreement at NEDLEC that all social partners will act decisively against corruption and fraud in their own ranks. Now, this is an issue which came up quite strongly at the NEDLEC level. And it was most heartening to, to hear all the partners at NEDLEC underscoring precisely this point. The public procurement bill will be fast-tracked and transversal contracts put in place for large volume items. 
We will soon finalize and begin the implementation of the National Anti-Corruption Strategy, which will improve transparency, which will also improve monitoring and accountability in government across society. Through these actions, we will ensure that every rand of public expenditure is spent productively to benefit our people and to support our recovery effort. Have faith that we have now turned the corner and that things are going to be done differently. All of these actions will be taken within a supportive macroeconomic framework which balances the need to restore fiscal sustainability with economic growth. A critical pillar of this plan is the fiscal framework that will be outlined by the Minister of Finance when he delivers the medium-term budget policy statement in two weeks or so. Among other things, this framework will provide a path of fiscal consolidation. It will also speak to our efforts for debt reduction and reprioritization that is supportive of growth and recovery. We cannot sustain the current levels of debt, particularly as increasing borrowing costs are diverting resources that should be utilized for economic and social development. That is why we are urgently implementing the economic reforms that we have agreed with our social partners at NEDLEC to unlock investment, stimulate economic activity, and generate revenue for the fiscus. In reducing government expenditure, we are ensuring that funds that are reprioritized towards po poverty alleviation, infrastructure investment, support for economic development and fighting crime and corruption are there to do precisely that. We are also reducing the reliance of SOEs on the fiscus by intensifying efforts to stabilize strategic companies, accelerating the rationalization of SOEs and where appropriate, identifying strategic equity partners for some of our SOEs. And I envision a stage where, like what other countries have done, like China, as well as Singapore, where some of our well-performing SOEs can even be listed to bring in fresh capital so that they can develop even further. It is clear that implementation is really going to be the key in giving effect to this recovery and reconstruction plan. This requires a much more effective and efficient state with greater coordination and integration between national, provincial, as well as local government. Through the district development model, we are beginning to see progress in the alignment of the work of different spheres to ensure focused and urgent implementation of the plan, dedicated capacity is being created in the presidency to drive progress and support departments and agencies in the implementation of their mandates. To fast track the delivery of economic reforms, Operation Vulindera will be implemented as a joint initiative of the Presidency and the National Treasury, reporting directly to the President on a regular basis. It will work closely with the Cabinet's economic cluster to ensure that the priority interventions and key enabling reforms are implemented rapidly and continuously, as well as effectively, and that those responsible for their implementation will be held accountable. A National Economic Recovery Council comprising of relevant members of cabinet will provide political oversight and enable rapid decision making. As 
we now continue to manage the coronavirus down, the National Council for Economic Recovery will now come into its own to enable all the various tasks and interventions that we have identified to be properly implemented. The Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation remains the backbone of government reporting on the five-year medium-term strategic framework. This will take place alongside the implementation arrangements which have been agreed among the social partners at NEDLEC. We will be releasing the NEDLEC Social Partner Economic Recovery Plan and the Social Compact for Energy Security. These contain very significant measures that, will be, that we will be working with our social partners on to ensure that we do implement. A presidential working committee chaired by the president will meet regularly to receive reports from each social partner on the extent to which it has implemented its commitments. It will be supported by the economic recovery leadership team and working groups on particular areas of the recovery plan. In the aftermath of a fire, fellow South Africans, green shoots begin to emerge. The ashes that will have formed and reach the soil and new life takes root to replace what was lost. Our country is emerging from one of the most difficult periods in living memory. South Africans have suffered and have made great sacrifices, sharing in their hardship with people all over the world. But as South Africans, we have a deep reservoir of resilience that we can draw upon. We have endured much during this period and have always emerged stronger and much more united. We stand together at a crucial time in the history of our country. This is necessary that we should stand together. Our ability to reignite our economy rests on the decisions that we take in this moment and the urgency with which we address this crisis. We should not wish to rest until we have fulfilled the potential of our country. We shall not rest until we have built this economy that we all yearn for, an economy that is based on fairness, justice, inclusive growth, and equality. This is the task of our generation, to renew, to rebuild, and to repair. We dare not take a moment to pause, and together, we have it within us to build this economy. The time is now. Let us go and do our work. Thank you very much. This is the time. That, uh, honorable members, that honorable My members way. concludes the business of the day. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the president for availing himself to deliver a speech on the reconstruction and economic recovery plan. The house is now adjourned. Long live, Chief Whip, long live. Long live.